Hello folks, welcome to this week's episode of Coastal Catch-Ups. Today I speak with Heidi McElvenny who is doing a PhD in seagrass and I hear all about the benefits of having seagrass around our coastline in Northern Ireland, the threats that they face and what can be done to help restore the habitats. So I learned a lot about seagrass today and I hope you do too. We also touch on some other organisations that Heidi is involved in, which is all about connecting people with our coastlines in terms of uh, it could be their work or it could be their hobbies and they just wanted to um, get involved and connected basically. So I hope you enjoy the episode and I'll catch you soon. It's all about Marie and the coastal sea, the aquatic life. Everything in between So sit on them And take a seat Coastal catch-ups With a stampede Heidi, thank you very much for coming on the Coastal Catch-ups. Could we start by getting a bit about yourself and your relationship with the coastline? I have kind of always being obsessed with the ocean. A lot of people can pinpoint that moment where, you know, something sparked their passion for whatever it might be. But for me, it's just always been there. My dad taught me to swim when I was really young and then threw me into the ocean. And, you know, every summer I was up in Benone bodyboarding. Anytime we went on a family holiday, it was an opportunity to snorkel like in a new place. And then I was lucky to learn to dive when I was 14. And then I progressed like through all the different paddy training courses through my teens. Um, and then when I was 21 or something, um, got my paddy dive master. So I've been able to, you know, experience all these cool places like diving with reef sharks and um, whale sharks and like beautiful coral reefs. And then over the last year, I have done some diving for the first time in Northern Ireland which is a much different experience like no warm clear waters here it's cold I learned to use a dry suit was diving on some wrecks um but over the last few years I've really fallen in love with the seas around the UK and Northern Ireland and for so long I thought if I want to be a marine biologist, I have to go live somewhere else. And that's just not the case, but we're not exposed to the opportunities that exist here. So I'm lucky that I've been able to come home and do what I love. And even in the last few years, you know, my focus has really been on the coast um, rather than more offshore where all those big charismatic species are because the coastline is, it's a place that's, you know, quite severely impacted by human activities in a negative way but it's also the first place where you can take people to experience the sea whether you know you're walking your dog on the beach or you go for a dip or even decide to go snorkeling so it's so close to us that it's also that usually the first place where we can have our first experience of the sea yeah that's a good point and I I think like the coast is where it all happens when people merge well it's just members of the public or with uh you know industries like it's all happens on the coast like um ports and harbors or like you say just going for a walk on the beach and that's where it all happens on the coast so you were dive so got your dive master at 21 and then so and then you mentioned about coming back in northern ireland to dive um whereabouts in northern ireland were you diving it sounds like was it port of ferry the wrecks or is it elsewhere it was in Strangford Lock. Um, I can't remember the name of the wreck. Um, it was fairly deep because that was part of the training that I had to do. Okay. Are you familiar with it, the name of the wreck? I know there's a wreck in Ring Hattie. Ring uh, yes, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I know my friend, Catherine, who I work with, her dad runs DB Diving. I did um, it with DB diving. DB diving, so we're going to give them a shout out here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, they did yeah. great training. It was because for part of my PhD research, I obviously have to dive here, but it required using 
um, like having two tanks and a full face mask for comms. Uh -huh. So all that specialty diving, they did the training for me and they were brilliant. And then I think from Ring Hattie, you can, you can launch it the wee, there's a, like a stone key. You can walk out from there. Um, yeah, I don't dive. Huge so starfish. I don't... Star starfish? Yeah, they're massive <laughs> down there. I think the UK, you mentioned about the stereotype of marine biologists and marine scientists working in nice crystal clear waters and coral reefs. And the reality is that, well, the UK has its in its own right beautiful waters. Like if you, some of the photos I see people put up of the seaweeds, the red and green seaweeds, it's just incredible. And like the north coast, I think particularly Strangford Locks, the visibility isn't great, but like north coast, the, the water up there is just incredibly clear. Around the kelp forests that are along the north coast, um, I've seen. I haven't been myself, but I've seen images, and it's absolutely stunning. But yeah, our locks do tend to be a little muddier usually, which makes the visibility worse. Yeah. Um. So that, uh, so that was your diving experience, and then in terms of what's keeping you busy these days, what, what, what's going on? So about a year ago, I started a PhD at Queen's University in Belfast. And I'd always kind of wanted to do a PhD, but was never sure, you know, when was the right time, or I wanted to make sure it was a project I was really interested in. And um, so it has been quite a few years since I did my master's and I've been working in the NGO sector. But this opportunity um, came up to really be able to shape my own research as opposed to having one already designed. Um, and I was able to then focus it in around seagrass habitats here in Northern Ireland, which is quite timely, given that they're kind of quite high priority in terms of policy and thinking about our climate mitigation strategies. It, it means that there's a lot of funding going into the research area. So felt like a good time to make the leap and go back to be a student. Nice. So you came up with your own topic on seagrass then. And what, what in particular are you looking at? There's a few different chapters that are all quite different from each other. But a, a significant bulk of it is focused on the carbon sequestration potential of seagrass. Um, so maybe just explain a bit about seagrass in case um, people haven't heard of it before. Um, it literally looks like the grass that you have in your garden, your lawn, um, at least for the species, the two species that we have here in Northern Ireland. Um, it's found in quite shallow waters. So we have an intertidal species, Zostra nultii, which you'll find in the intertidal zone, meaning that it can survive being completely exposed and um, when the tide's fully out um, or fully submerged when the tide's in. And then a little further down the shore, you have Zostra marina, which is our subtidal species that tends to be a bit bigger, thicker, longer leaves, um, looks prettier in photographs, <laughs> um, but both are really important habitats for supporting other wildlife. You know, they, they create food and home and a 3D structure for invertebrates and little anemones, and they act as nursery grounds for small fish species, even ones that, you know, will leave the nursery ground and go out and are important for our commercial fisheries. So that's kind of my focus habitat. And along with all those other ecosystem services, they're now being prioritized because of their carbon sequestration potential, which essentially means that they have the ability to lock away carbon for a very long time. Um, so one of my questions is how much organic carbon is actually stored in the sediment below the habitat? And that's where, that's where they store all the carbon. So those sediments, usually muddy or sandy, can be really deep, quite a few meters. So that means that there's, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe even million years worth of accumulation of sediment. So it's it's a long time that that carbon's been locked away, and it means that it hasn't, you know, re-entered the water column or potentially re-entered the atmosphere. So people are, what are thinking, okay, it's really important that we make sure that that carbon stays locked away. Firstly. Secondly, that our habitats can continue to lock away even more carbon. And thirdly, because we know we've lost a lot of our seagrass habitats in the past, how can we potentially restore them so that we can 
kind of renew or revitalize this ecosystem service that they provide. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, when you mentioned about habitats and the two types of species, so there's one intertidal and one subtitle, basically. In my mind, the we're talking about Strangford Lock. I'm going to go back to Strangford Lock. Frank Geese come in. They rely, is that the eel grass? That, yes. Um, is the intertidal species. So it's so important for wintering birds and I'm sure other um, birds that visit um, um, the shores of Northern Ireland. Um, the subtital stuff, is it, is, this is just a question that popped into my head. Is it seasonal? Is the grass seasonal? So winter time you can't really see it in summertime you can see it is that or am I making that up and um, for the intertidal so yes yeah, some people call it eelgrass or some people call it dwarf eelgrass okay and um, that so we don't have a full picture of the dynamics because we don't have year-long monitoring of these habitats um, and okay. in most places we definitely don't have it in Northern Ireland but generally speaking it its growing period is during the summer and it'll peak towards the end of the summer. And then, like you said, the Brent geese um, arrive and it's key food source for them. So they eat all, most of it. <laughs> um, and when you go out in the winter or towards the end of the winter, it's pretty much all gone. There'll only be a few bits left, but it'll it'll regrow um, each year. The subtitle stuff, um, I'm not entirely sure. It obviously doesn't get fed on by birds um, like the Brent geese. So it's likely to be less, like have have less of those dynamic changes. But again, nobody's monitoring it. Um, you're you had a person on the podcast before called Dr. Rachel Miller. Rachel Miller. Um, I know that she's part of the dive team looking at the seagrass regrowth for an eco mooring in Strangford Lock, and they actually dived in March, which is unusual because sometimes it's usually the summer period. So that'll be really exciting to, to get the results of her diving over the next few years to see what it actually looks like at other times of year to help us, you know, figure out what's going on. Keep putting the dry suit on, Rachel. Keep... <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping she's going to help me in the summertime with some of my diving. Um that I need to do for my research. But the other um, thing to think about in terms of seasonal dynamics is the carbon as well. Um, so I will be taking carbon sediment cores on the intertidal beds um, once per season, because the majority of the data that's out there at the moment is taken from um, cores only during the summer when the seagrass is, is at its most lush. Um, but it's important to understand, especially for that top layer of sediment that's most like most vulnerable to being remineralized how is that actually changing or accumulating um during the winter whenever there isn't as much canopy to protect it or there's also increasing like stormier weather and stuff so there could potentially be a, a slight decrease after the grass has been removed and yeah potentially yeah. carbon storage in terms of is it is it the sediment? So in my mind, there's two things. So carbon can be stored in the actual grass itself. But I think it's called biomass storage. And then there's the sediment that maybe flows through the, the grass beds and then settles in. Is it, so it's more of a case of sediment settling in the beds you're interested in, is that right? Yes, yeah, so this is where our blue carbon habitats, like our seagrasses, also our salt marshes and um, mangroves, but we don't have those here. They're tropical water. So salt marsh and seagrasses here mainly. They're different in terms of their carbon sequestration potential compared to terrestrial habitats, mainly because of what you've said there. The majority of the organic carbon is locked away in the sediment below the habitat as opposed to in the living material itself whereas if you look at trees it's mostly stored in you know the trunks and the leaves and then there's different risks that come with that you know wildfires increasing or or just like the removal of tree species you're get uh, sort of releasing that carbon whereas you don't have that kind of risk in the sea However, you can still have physical disturbance or destruction of a habitat um, that can release the 
organic carbon from the sediment itself. So is it fair to say that blue carbon ecosystems can store more then than terrestrial ecosystems? Is As a general swooping question, that seems to be true. Um, Seagrasses, salt marshes and mangroves vary a lot in terms of even between different species of themselves. So seagrass habitats, there's lots of different species. I've mentioned the two that are here in Northern Ireland. And um, there's a species called Posidonia oceanica. That might not be how you actually pronounce it. Um, but it can be found in the Mediterranean and it's much, much bigger. So like the leaves are a couple of meters and it's most of the estimates think that it's storing significantly more carbon than our much smaller species. And that would make sense um, because, you know, the wa water flow is going to be reduced a lot more, encouraging more particles to kind of accumulate on the seabed. The other important difference, though, between blue carbon habitats and terrestrial carbon habitats is that the sediment in the ocean is anoxic. So you essentially have really low oxygen conditions to no, to no oxygen within the sediment. That prevents bacteria from breaking down the organic carbon. So that's why it actually stays there. Whereas if you look at soil on land, there's lots of microbial activity that do different things, that one of which is breaking down our organic matter. Um, so therefore, it's not locked away for length, long periods of time. So seagrass is vital for carbon storage. Um, you mentioned about we have lost a lot of our seagrass beds. What has happened and what are the threats to seagrass at the minute? Yeah, um, so a paper came out a few years, a couple of years ago, so it's still quite recent, that specifically looked at seagrass loss in the UK. And it's very hard to kind of get an estimate of that because we don't have good historical records. So we don't really have maps saying seagrass existed here to this extent during this period of time. But that re those records do exist in some places. So they estimated very conservatively that we've lost around 40% of our seagrass habitats. But they did put in that paper that, you know, they're confident in that estimate, but it could be as high as 92%. So a huge amount, basically, of this habitat has disappeared from our coastlines. Um, important to note that that paper didn't have data from Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland tends to be quite data poor, especially for our marine kind of habitats. Um, the key drivers of seagrass loss, there's, there's kind of three main ones. There's physical disturbance, um, so literally kind of tearing the seagrass up out of the sediment. That can happen from boats anchoring and mooring on top of a seagrass bed um, or for the intertidal beds. Sometimes you'll see like tractor marks, maybe for farmers going to their aquaculture um, areas, go through a seagrass bed, which isn't good. The second is a disease it's called wasting disease. It mainly affected seagrass beds in the 1930s. And um, there isn't, you know, it's present in some beds now, but it hasn't completely sort of wiped out populations um, since then. And then the last one is water quality. Um, so increased inputs of nutrients can have quite significant negative impacts on beds. And that is likely to be impacting the beds here around Northern Ireland. Um, I can't say that definitively because no one's actually done the research but it's part of it's one of my chapters in my PhD that I, I want to look at the condition of the beds and try and relate that to potential drivers or pressures around the bed. Okay so we have physical disturbance between chains running across the seabed or tractor tires which is a good point if you think about like farmers accessing oyster beds and stuff like that I'm sure um, I think they use the big tractors with the really wide wheels to stop them sinking. So you can imagine the impact of that happening every time. Uh, then we have disease and then we have water quality. Um, what sort of factors in the water quality would affect seagrass? Is it is it like temperature, pH, you know, that sort of stuff? Or is it more um, 
pollutants with from contaminants from industry or sewage or uh, yeah, any other sources it's mostly to do with the level of nutrients in the water which right. can be a result of um like urban runoff agricultural runoff uh wastewater discharge so your usual kind of culprits but it just depends where the seagrass bed is situated like is it closer to a town or a city or is it you know completely surrounded by farmland will depend on what the biggest pressure is in terms of mitigating the impact then of seagrass we mentioned about the likes of eco marines how important is that um, for the habitats going forward because we know that we don't have as much seagrass as we used to, our first priority has to be protecting what we have. And if you can alleviate physical disturbances, then we should be doing that pretty quickly. Eco moorings have our proven technology. You know, they've been rolled out in other parts of the world. It's great now that Northern Ireland has a trial. So they've installed two different ones, trying to see which one, you know, works out the best. Um, but I think it is important that we do that pretty swiftly because it well there I mean people have been mooring their boats in some areas for for years and years and years so the the scarring that will be have left by by the chain will be quite significant but seagrass is very good at recovering so as soon as you lift that chain off the ground it's likely that it will grow back and fill in those patches which is good um and. It doesn't stop people from using their boats in those areas. You know, you can you can have happy, healthy seagrass and happy, healthy people. It doesn't have to be one or the other, which is good. Um, but because so that's that's kind of what's known as passive restoration. So take away the pressure and it'll recover itself. But because seagrasses habitats are in such sort of poor condition and and in such limited extent now. And people have decided that active restoration is actually what's needed, where you're literally planting either seagrass seeds or taking little plugs of the plant and putting it in a new place to try and reestablish it in new areas. We haven't trialed anything like that in Northern Ireland yet, but hopefully that's something we can do. But the question is, where do you do it? Where does it make sense historically, but also where does it make sense to do that given we have changing climatic conditions? And, um, you know, is it going to survive as we get more rainfall or we get warmer sea temperatures or more storms? And um, also, they, so especially for like our intertidal habitats, as sea levels rise, will they be able to keep up? with and, and move further up the shore so that they still get the levels of exposure exposure and submersion that they need or are they trapped because we've built like hard sea defenses in some places so there's actually nowhere for them to move back to and um, that's actually particularly important for salt marshes um of which we have very very little um because of you know people build houses and infrastructure and farm pretty much right up to the coastline so there's some tough decisions there about well, what's the best use for this land what can we give back to nature and what do we need to sort of stand strong on if that makes sense yeah like that's one of the key i suppose this is coming back to like the whole general theme of this podcast about sustainable use so you mentioned about the passive restoration with eco marines which would allow a habitat to exist in alongside human activity recreation um which is absolute would be great the in terms of you're describing coastal squeeze there is not right about the habitats not being able to migrate back yeah uh if there's a if someone puts in a hard flood wall it could wipe out a habitat if there's nowhere for it to go when it, um, the sea level rises and then I suppose you could bring in that's when people look at alternatives such as soft engineering whereas or that's when maybe human settlements or properties maybe might be at risk I mean it's it's difficult it's really difficult when human 
properties and buildings get involved because mm -hmm. I think generally they come off top. I don't know if that's if you agree. I think it's fair to say that the environment and nature has not been top of the priority list politically for the last like well probably forever in Northern Ireland and ultimately these decisions are political they're not only like based on pure science and um, so much goes into the decision making um, but it's a good thing that Northern Ireland now has a climate change act and in that act there's a line about um, having to consider nature-based projects or nature-based solutions and that's the things we've been talking about in terms of soft engineering managed realignment and restoration projects like eco moorings or actively planting seagrass so there's a legislative driver to do these things now so hopefully we can start to make some better decisions because it's not just oh if we get rid of the salt marsh and build a wall we lose so much more than our salt marsh because it's more than just like a species in itself it is a habitat that supports so much other nature um, and we have to take that into account plus there's a, there's a, you know it's ultimately over the long term it's usually a better choice economically to make these decisions that um support nature and nature's recovery um even though they sometimes could be more difficult decisions to make in the short term. So in the future, could we put out an early call for volunteers now that would go out on mud flats and plant little seedlings of seagrass? Is this, that would is be... this too premature? <laughs> Might be a bit premature, but <laughs> watch this space. Um, I think the first the first thing we need to do is we need to know exactly where our seagrass habitats are, what condition they're in, and why they're in that condition. And then that'll give us an idea of okay, where in terms like what where makes the most sense to do some active restoration. But I am a hundred percent in favor of actively trying to bring nature back in all of its forms on land and at sea because we're so nature per and it's and it's sad. And sometimes people think environmental policies are quite radical. And that blows my mind because I think a world without nature is radical. How could you possibly want that as a, as a preference? So yes, listeners, keep an eye out for future restoration projects because we all the ones that I've visited and read about across the UK and you know they've been taking place in America and Australia as well. It, they do require a lot of volunteer support. This is not something that could be done by like one weird little scientist at a university. It takes everybody because you have to collect, you know, millions of seeds and then you kind of have them over the winter and then you have to replant them in these little hessian bags full of sand. So the, if you're willing to get out and help with that, that would be fantastic. Just let me know, Heidi. I'll put the call out whenever, whenever <laughs> it's in place. <laughs> um, no, that's great, and um, it's been great to hear about your knowledge of seagrass and um, the PhD you're doing. Wish you all the best with the rest of the research. In terms of other organisations you're involved with, then Heidi, in your if you have any spare time after doing all this research, but um, any other organisations you're involved with. Yes, so I'm a member of the Irish Ocean Literacy Network, and I'd really encourage everybody to check out their website. You literally just Google Irish Ocean Literacy Network. They are a network of different organisations from across the island of Ireland. They span from conservation organisations to um, like established universities and the likes of the Marine Institute in AFBI. Um, and different industries like aquaculture, fisheries, um, all sorts of things. And it's about bringing people together so that we can understand um, our impact on the ocean and the ocean's impact on us and encourage dialogue. So that network is going through a bit of a transition period, but um, in the future, there will be lots of opportunities to network with these organisations. There'll be training opportunities and events. Um, and you can join as an individual or as a representative of your organization. 
I'd also like to shout out another project that's ongoing in Carlingford Lock. If you're in, in and around the area, it's called Shifting Tides and it's a mixture of um, citizen science around the, it's a, a, like a coastal based project. So some of it is about the seagrass there, um, but it's mixed with a lot of work with artists. So different ways of expressing and interacting and yeah, how, how you feel about nature, things like that. So you can give that a Google as well and sign up to their events. They have a couple on now and they'll have lots more on in the summer. And are these like exhibitions or are these like workshops people can turn up and is it hands-on work? What sort of? It's a mix. So sometimes there's speakers, sometimes it's getting out hands-on doing the science stuff. Sometimes it's workshops with the artists or it could be an ex, well, further towards the end of the project, I suspect there'll be an exhibition. Very good. Um, the ocean literacy stuff, I imagine that's important you're bringing in a lot of different organizations that maybe focus on a particular aspect, for example, yourself with seagrass and then bringing it in with maybe someone, I don't know, um, another particular topic. And it's important for that dialogue between all the different networks. Is that is that kind of the, the aim of that? Yeah, the aim is to try and connect everyone up so that mm -hmm. we can all kind of move together more strategically. And yes, there are areas where not where maybe some organizations or industries come into attention, but under there's sort of ten ocean literacy principles. It's a United Nations decade uh, concept that you can read about. Um, and fundamentally, whether you are playing in the sea or working in the sea, it's about understanding that connection and how you treat the ocean how the ocean can treat you back kind of and it, it encompasses all sorts of things between um knowledge production which is quite scientific through to um emotions and spiritual connection as well as like activism um or recreation um so that's why everybody's welcome and hopefully everybody gets something out of the network that benefits them and the the sort of high level vision of the network is to have an ocean literate society which can sound a bit highfalutin but to me it's really important because it goes back to the fact that we are an like an island community and sometimes I think we forget that you know we're not very big in Northern Ireland you're something like never more than 35 miles from the sea like we're so connected and even if you look at our river systems you know if you look at a map and you remove all the land and just have the rivers you can tell exactly where you know the big populations are and the and the shape of our coastline it's all there and um, so I think we should we need to reignite that a bit more reconnect with our island heritage and I think that would have a massive impact when even just planting little seeds of knowledge and maybe someone's not aware of I don't know seagrass beds or you know and it's and it's just making everyone aware of what's happening and then how our actions can and the likes about river network in northern ireland you could for example in litter entering storm drains from a street in belfast and enter and then ending up in belfast lock and etc you know it's how it's all interconnected and making people just aware of it is that right yeah exactly and just because you've given me that example, a few weeks ago, I was in Belfast City Centre, walking back um, from having a dinner out. It was like, you know, 10 o'clock. So people are out and about and it's quite lively. And I see someone got handed like a pamphlet to advertise something and they clearly didn't want it. So they put it in the storm drain as if that was a bin. And that just blew my mind. But it's because not everyone realises that that's actually not just going to I don't know where they think it's going to be honest but it's ending up in the law um and so, there's probably a person who'll be walking at Helen's Bay or something and be like oh you know this is look at all this beach. yeah yeah it's all connected at the end of the day and um yeah so I think those two organizations sound like yeah it's they're doing a great thing by um allowing people to connect with our coastline and like you say the island I think it's something to be proud of and reignited as you say and I think um, yeah 
Yeah, and it's exactly what you're doing with this podcast here. You know, you decided you wanted to learn from people who do so many different things, like live, work and play differently around the coastline. And then you've been really generous in making it a podcast so that we can all like learn and experience that along with you. So I think this is really brilliant. Yeah, no, I've I've really enjoyed this journey because you hear about people that use it for work or for play and all the different ways it helps people and it could be mental health it could be physical exercise it could be actually helping the environment you know and it's the list is just endless and and hopefully hopefully it'll continue to go and uh yeah if you've any recommendations of people that could come on please let me know <laughs> there's loads you've already interviewed a few of my friends and colleagues they are brilliant but there's yeah. that's also something that really excites me like there's a generation of people who are like early career that I've had, you know, been able to work with. And I think, oh, you're brilliant. And I hope you stay in the sector, like, because you're going to do great things and really make big changes. So there's lots of good people that you can talk to. I'll certainly recommend a few. You maybe thought you would escape this question, but the TED talk you did recently. <laughs> yes, the TED it, talk. It, no, well, tell me how you got how you got involved in that and where people can watch it um so the ted talk is on youtube you can search my name if you so wish to watch it it is about uh blue carbon habitats um and more widely about you know bringing nature back is a way for us to strengthen our um defense against the worst impacts of climate change um it was held in Stormont so the Centre for Democracy organised it as a TEDx Stormont event and the theme was Restore so there's a huge variety of talks that I'd recommend you listen to there's some around mental health there's some around music and um, John Martin head of advocacy and campaigning at RSPB did one on nature recovery also which is excellent and um, so because I wanted to talk specifically about ocean restoration and um, I pitched that as a talk and they accepted me as a speaker and it was a really interesting experience because the delivery of a TED talk is very different from a scientific presentation, a business pitch or even delivering training. You know, you really have to think differently about how you deliver it. So I learned a lot doing that process. Yeah, I watched it last week and you smashed it. I think you you came across like very smooth, you know, just the concepts you delivered in a very simple and way that way that people can easily understand. And yeah, just thought it was very smooth. Um, yeah. So if anyone wants to find out more about um blue carbon, you you can head over and watch that YouTube video of your TED talk. Um, yes. Don't mind me plugging up, but I thought people, no. like, people would be interested to hear. Um, Thank you very much. And if anyone has the opportunity to do a TED Talk, um, I would highly recommend it. Um, I think it's made a big difference to how I communicate ideas. And it was very kind of you to say there that I, I was able to talk about the concepts in a way that was quite simple because that's you're so used to talking to people in your field whereas the audience on the day was so varied and I didn't know what people didn't know <laughs> um, so I'm um, trying to think about how you get people to care get people to listen get people to understand get people to feel is um important and something maybe we don't spend a lot of time usually thinking about mm -hmm. yeah yeah no certainly came across that uh you definitely picked all those boxes. So, um, yeah, it was awesome. Heidi, uh, just want to say thank you very much for coming on on a Friday afternoon. You could probably be doing other things, but uh, thank you for coming on to Coastal Catch Ups. No problem at all. I was delighted that you had an interest in seagrass, and I'm always happy to talk a bit about it. Yeah, no, an opportunity to pick a Experts brain uh, can't turn that down. So no, um, it was awesome. And I'm sure everyone listening has found it interesting. So thank you for your time and I'll catch you soon. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed that episode with Heidi and learned a lot about seagrass habitats. For me, the as you know, you've probably found trend in what I'm interested in and allowing these habitats spaces to exist um, alongside humans um, without any disturbance. And then you also have the active restoration with seagrass, which doesn't currently happen in Northern Ireland, but perhaps in the very near future, that will be there will be a call for volunteers to go out and plant seagrass. So um, here's your warning and keep an eye out for more of that. Also really enjoyed the learning about ocean literacy and connecting people to our coastline, which is very, very important to make people aware of what happens in our coastline under the low water mark or um, we used the example of dropping litter in a street in Belfast and it could be ended up in Belfast Lock. And that might sound stupid to you, but um, I'm sure if you look at the lagging on a wet day, um, yeah, you'd probably be disgusted. So it's just how it's all connected, our behaviour on land and our, how it impacts our coastline. If you've enjoyed the episode today, leave a review and share it with someone who you think might find it interesting. I'm sure some budding marine biologists or someone who just is a general user of our coastline around Northern Ireland who might find this interesting. Just a quick one on my upcoming collaboration with Strangford Lock Boat Tours. We have uh, organised an eco-tour of the lock starting in April and running into May. So the idea is, uh, yeah, I'll be your tour guide round strength for lock and point out various habitats features and if we're lucky some species um around lock andy who runs strength for lock boat tours is a registered with the wise scheme and basically this means he's a responsible tour operator and will basically the objective is not to have any impact on wildlife during a tour so we won't be chasing any dolphins around it's It'll purely be if we spot anything, we'll observe from a distance and take it all in and let the animals control the encounter. Otherwise, yeah, it should be good crack, uh, a good day out in the sea, and hopefully we get the weather for it. So if you're keen, I'll pop the link below. And apart from that, I hope, hope you have a good week and I'll catch you soon.